Hi, this is Daniela Cambone and welcome back to StansberryInvestor.com. Last year, when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,000%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789% in Overstock before it shot up over 1,000%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. And right now you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works. A way to type in any of the 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to powergagetrial.com for your free look. Again, that's powergagetrial.com for your free look. All right, let's get to our segment today. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone, and welcome back to Stansberry Research and our Outlook series, The Tipping Point 2022. Please welcome back to our show to conclude this incredible Outlook series, Nomi Prince. She's the best-selling author of Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. She's also a former Goldman Sachs Managing Director, and she has a new book coming out this fall called Permanent Distortion, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the show. Nomi, always good to see you. Welcome back. Thank you so much. And what a great series. Thanks for having me on it. Well, absolutely. And I'm happy that you're uh, rounding out all the discussions. We're concluding our outlook with you today. We're going to talk the Fed. We're going to talk inflation. <laughs> We're going to talk monetary policy and uh, the global financial crisis that is uh, just really in front of our eyes right here. So a lot of ground to cover. Um, I want to bring up something that you've said in the past, uh, Nomi, here about the financial crisis. You said that big banks have massively profited from access to cheap money. And you've written, no significant regulations have been introduced to fix the structural problems behind the last financial crisis. Banks and the markets have been subsidized by conjured uh, money policy. Strong words here. Um, what are we up against? Well, well, here's the thing. We, we were up against a, a very artificially inflated market environment um, in general. And that's partly because of what happened in the wake of 2008, which is the Fed and all its sort of cohorts, the major central banks in the world, conjured. And I call it conjured, manufactured or fabricated money, because this is money that comes from literally the wanting to create it and in return purchase bonds, keep rates at zero or low or negative Globally, that happened in the wake of the crisis. That got a double down booster shot um, in the wake of the pandemic. And one of the things that happened was the Fed's balance sheet blew up from basically around four, $4.1 trillion, which is a big number anyway, um, to what's now about $9 trillion. And all of the philosophy um, behind that and, and the impetus behind that lack of limitation on what can be done in what is dubbed an emergency, whether it is or not, um, and sometimes it is more than others, um, has not changed. What banks have been able to capitalize on, um, therefore, because of this entire trajectory that started back then and has gone on turbo boost now, um, is this ability to hoard cash, to leverage balance sheets beneath kind of the risk regulations that are out there. They can still churn effectively depositors into asset management fee-driven business for them. We have record M&As because money is cheap, and we have record debt, um, both government and corporate in the United States and around the world, because money has been so cheap. So we have an overriding monetary system that benefits those that have the best access to the cheapest money at any point in time, and, and really to the detriment of, of anyone else. Really well said, Nomi. And, you know, as we're, as the Fed is about to, to start, um, you know, an aggressive if you want to call it aggressive, taper program, you say this still won't be enough. In a recent tweet, you said if the Fed went at the same pace as the last time it trimmed its balance sheet, progress would barely be noticeable given the large stock of assets the Fed has accumulated. So is this all in vain? Well, it's not so much that it's um, in, in vain. There's, there's two problems with the Fed. Well, there's a lot of problems with the Fed. But one of the main problems is that when it goes into overdrive, um, it doesn't articulate a plan 
to, to give, you know, to come back from that position. It's just sort of like, we need to do this now. We're going to flood tons of money into the markets. It's going to go wherever. Um, and as we've seen, it's inflated um, the market relative to the real economy. It, it, it does that because it's just such a flush coming in. Um, and they don't articulate at the beginning, at the onset, they don't think about articulating how they can step that back. So what happens is when other events occur, um, supply side X, materials, components, everything that we need, which has been um, diminished because of the pandemic. Also before the pandemic, because of trade wars, which we don't even talk about anymore because of the pandemic. Th there has been sort of a depletion in um, the acceleration of the supply side relative to demand. That causes inflation. That will continue to cause inflation. The Fed steps in now and says, all right, we're going to reduce our book. You know, We might sell it. We might run it off. They haven't been 100% clear. There's been a lot of market conjecture as to what they mean, but they don't have a plan. They just say, we will probably do this. Their dot plot, their report shows that they will probably have three to four rate hikes um, throughout 2022, more in 2023 and 2024, uh, to get up to a 2% um, sort of long end rate. Now, uh, short end rate, and, and as we see, the yield curve um, hasn't really moved too much as a result. Everything's kind of still in check. Um, but what it means is they, they they create this uncertainty in the markets and the markets like overreact to the Fed being late to doing their job, um, which is technically as it is written, uh, one of which is to maintain price stability. Um, they do it kind of after the fact and then they create all this extra fear and volatility and uncertainty. And then we got all these jolts in the markets that were overpriced to begin with. And they sort of exacerbate the problem um, of that component of what their monetary policy actually does. So is it an impossible balancing act that the Fed is trying to do here, Nomi? Because I've spoken to other experts who've, who've said, look, you know, they're going to try and want to combat this inflation without crashing the stock market. Is, is that possible to do or are they just going to, you know, fight it a little bit? Maybe we'll get a 20, 30 percent correction. What do you think their plan is if they have one? Well, well this is the thing. I, I think their plan um, tends to change with. The markets whipsawing in general and, and all of this period actually reminds me of the beginning of 2016 the fed signaled um at the end well they actually raised rates by just 25 basis points after seven years of not um in the december of 2015. what happened in 2016 for different reasons um there, there was a lot of other uncertainty that came in the market but predominantly um the downside in the market in january of 2016 was related to the uncertainty of whether the fed would make good on what was then a uh, forecast of three to four rate hikes during 2016, just like we have that now uh, for 2022. Now the environment's different. We didn't have a pandemic before that. We didn't have the kind of inflation that stems from other uh, reasons as well in the real uh, economic kind of parameters that we're seeing in consumer prices and industrial prices and so forth. So it's a little bit of a different environment, but I believe that what the Fed wants to do is not see the markets freak out. It does want to do both. And it's in this bind because it didn't signal in the beginning that it would have a plan later of trying to play sort of catch up and yeah. calming inflation while recognizing that the markets uh, don't want tightening no matter what the projections are. So I think they're going to dial back. You know, there's forecasts out there. They're going to do like seven rate hikes this year. That would be I, I, that would be unrealistic in terms of what the Fed policy has been and how they've navigated choppiness um, against whether it's inflation or trying to stimulate, um, as they say, growth or employment. So I think, you know, we might see two, we might see three at the most. Yeah, a really good point, Naomi. So at the end of the day, you you believe that the Fed, if they had to choose, they're pinned up against the wall here. They'd rather save the market here yeah. uh, than focus a thousand percent on bringing that inflation number down. That that's 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 what they want to do. Will they actually fork? Will they broadcast that? No. Um, and and in this particular time, because they've gotten so much flack over the last time, where the markets have again inflated net of actual prices, but but financial assets have inflated um, by so much so quickly, uh, they will not say that. They will not want to indicate that they are actually watching the markets. But look, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell has a lot of his own money in the markets, and like every other person who has any investments in the markets 
benefits, whether it's through 401ks um, or larger asset management plans or large companies who have a lot of money in the markets, moving the markets, they watch this stuff all the time. So he's got two jobs, right? He's got, he's running the Fed, um, but he's also looking at his own finances. And, and, and it, it might be that the, you know, he, he can't say that those two are, are related, but at the same time, he's not oblivious um, to, to, to what's going on. And, and, and no one, especially in an election year, wants the markets to plummet from, again, inflated highs. But still, that's what we had. And we've seen a significant correction already this year um, on their watch. Exactly. Um, and talking about inflation, uh, just one step further here, because you've been very vocal about it, and I think it's an important point to bring up, um, that the folks uh, suffering uh, the most from the inflation crunch here is really America's heartland, uh, where inflation is running, uh, you know, it's a hotbed, it's running rampant. Um, are they the forgotten here, Nomi? Yeah, absolutely, because this is a part of not having that plan to begin with and not recognizing, sort of reading the room of what's happening with prices to, to regular people um, in their ordinary sort of expenses that they deal with on a regular basis, you know, with, with gas prices up, with the cost of fixing stuff around the house up, with food, with, with you know, in, insurance and healthcare costs, all of the things that, that have risen um, due to supply disruptions, due to um, inflation in general, due to market expectations of inflation going forward and due to what they actually take out of their own pockets relative to what they earn, all of these figures have been high um, before the Fed noticed them. Um, and, and this is another one of the problems. Last year, um, for months, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was talking about inflation being temporary and, and talking about it as a sort of amorphous concept as opposed to saying, but you know what? I know inflation hurts uh, the real person trying to stretch their real paycheck out in the real world and, and indicating that the Fed actually understands that until way later in the game when what happens in real life is when prices go up and your wages haven't or your earnings haven't basically risen by the same or by more, you're digging a hole into your own pocket. And so you have to dig out of that hole just to break even on the inflation that already happened. And that's where the Fed not having a plan and not reading the room in advance really takes a toll. I know, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the labor shortage that we're facing, the supply chain issues. How does that play out for you? Does it get worse or can we recover here? I think the supply chain issues will will diminish to an extent, but right now, um, you know, we have ports that are overburdened that can't get stuff out. You know, we have a semiconductor situation where there still is not enough, you know, chips to go into the manufacturing of of autos, of phones, of just literally everything that that requires a a, a chip, and all of these things will take time to basically reproduce the shortfall as well as produce what is required for any demand that's related to growth, growth in the economy or growth in any one of those, those sectors. So it's gonna take some time to basically balance itself out. And what that means is um, we are gonna see, I think inflated prices in those sorts of materials, whether it's building materials for projects that kind of stopped and then restarted, whether it's chips to go into cars that are um, kind of waiting to, to basically come out into the new years. You know, we, we've seen that kind of slow down. That's going to take some time. And that's going to keep inflation on those types of materials and those types of necessities high, I think, for, for some period of time. And again, that supply side problem was, was already growing before the pandemic. It was just way exacerbated because of the pandemic and because of the actual shutdowns. But but the, the trade wars and those sort of uh, really difficult relationships between, for example, the US and China and also the regional players in between already were taking some of their toll. So we have that to work with as well. Noe, before I ask you um, assets you're liking right now, can you comment on the pressure that we're seeing on risk assets like, like the cryptocurrencies? Why the pressure here? Well, I think a lot of that pressure does come from the uncertainty as to um, what the Fed actually will do relative to what it has said. So the first knee-jerk reaction is um, to believe that money's going to get really tight really quickly and the Fed's going to shrink its balance sheet because that's what it kind of said without really looking at the numbers, which is that 
if and even if, and you mentioned my tweet, even if the Fed were to reduce its balance sheet, it's still going to be significantly higher than it was before the pandemic. And so there's still going to be this float of, of money supply and cheap money around the world. And we have other central banks like the People's Bank of China, the European Central Bank, Bank of Japan. They're not really doing much with curtailing their money supply or the cheapness of their rates. So globally, it's going to stay the same. But the freak out um, of the cryptocurrencies in particular was a result of, of money basically coming out because of that uncertainty that there's going to be this, this reduction in the looseness or the cheapness overall of money. And I think that was one of the major reactions to, to the crypto market. I mean, let's not forget the crypto market basically exists and grew because of the financial crisis of 2008, because there was a moment in time where the right confluence of of, of technological work and computer programming work and math and everything else came together um, because there was a real dissatisfaction with how fiat currencies could just be produced so expansively, um, again, without a plan and that there had to be an alternative. And that's still the case. Right, I was gonna ask you, you just beat me to it. It's still the case, that dissatisfaction is still there. So you believe the case for Bitcoin and the other cryptos is still alive. Oh no, absolutely, because because that reaction um, is 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 visceral relative to the kinds of monetary policies that we have seen, that we still are in, and that have not um, fundamentally gone away. Even again, if the Fed raises rates um, to two percent in the front end, even if that happens over some period of time, even if they shrink their book, that the result will not change the fact that globally our average rate is very, very low historically. And also the average size of the assets that the central banks hold is high historically. Nomi, bring it home for us now. Uh, assets you like and are eyeing this year. So I, I really like some of the areas that are, are going to basically promote the change out of this um, disconnected, out of this distorted environment between financial sort of cash assets and what's going on in the real economy. I, I do believe something has to give. And so I think in areas um, like renewables, sustainables, new energy, the technology that connects information and communication, sort of transformative technology has been beaten up so badly um, in this current round of uncertainty. And I do think that that change um, that relates to the metaverse, that relates to AI, but AI and, and, and virtual reality that helps in healthcare, that helps in engineering, that helps in building, that helps in this blend of connecting the development of real sustainable structures um, and, and energy sources with what drives them forward, I think will be areas that are going to come out of this current correction and that will um, lead the way forward as well. I think infrastructure is kind of the blend of all of that, whether it is physical infrastructure, whether it is virtual infrastructure, communications infrastructure that allows us to create and sort of innovate from here. That's one of the things that happens after multiple periods of sort of recessions and even um, dislocations between the market and the real economy is that at some point that money actually goes into uh, pushing forward. And I see the sectors that, that do that um, as the ones to be in in the medium term and the long term. Thank you for that, Nomi. And just one uh, last point in terms of exciting news this year. You have a new book uh, coming out this fall, uh, Permanent Distortions. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, yeah, so that's been a, a book I've been working on basically since the pandemic began and, and evolving as, as I've, I've witnessed a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, um, what I consider to be a permanent distortion, not just a distortion between um, what the markets do and how they behave and, and what the real economy does and where it's going to go. Um, it was distorted to begin with from 2008. It got permanently distorted um, in 2020 with what the central banks did and what they showed they can do, which is basically produce, create, conjure, manufacture money without a limit at the times that they need to. And, and the, the manifestations of that on the markets and the real economy is the real focus of the book, as well as um, a good quarter of it um, really looking forward into some of the things that we discussed and where we are moving as a result of kind of the pushback to this distortion and, and where we can go, because I think it's really an exciting um, time for all of that. Absolutely. And I, I think it's a perfect time uh, for your book, Nomi. Uh, well, well, we'll speak to you before that comes out. Absolutely. But, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on uh, to conclude our outlook. Thank you so much. Thank you.
for the folks back at home. I hope uh, it left you some with some great takeaways and you enjoyed it. But in the meantime, we'll continue having incredible content and guests coming your way. So be sure to stay tuned to stansberryresearch.com and sign up for exclusive content you can't get anywhere else at DaniellaCombone.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.